Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Claire Trevian and I'm the Head of Content Marketing at PASSEL. So today we're going to cover all of the basics of content marketing for business, what is and isn't content marketing. I'll also be sharing some tips for managing a content marketing strategy. Um, so let's just dive right in. If you have any questions, there is uh, the option to type one in, or you can also just get in touch with me after the webinar and I'll be happy to cover anything that hasn't been talked about today. I'm going to try and make this um, under 30 minutes, so let's just get started. Okay, so first of all, what is content marketing? So a good place to start would probably be the Content Marketing Institute, and this is their definition of content marketing. Content marketing is a strategic marketing approach focused on creating and distributing valuable, relevant, and consistent content to attract and retain a clearly defined audience, and ultimately to drive profitable customer action. Okay, so my version of that is to say that content marketing focuses less on adverts and more on creating and curating tailored content, and really I should have added to that for a specific audience. What counts as content marketing? Generally, when people bring it up, you might think of blogs as the main thing, but blogs is just the tip of the iceberg. These are all things that count as content marketing. So yes, there's a blog post, but also a newsletter, you know, email marketing campaigns in general. Social media updates are another one, and the lines are so blurry now as well, especially with things like Facebook Notes and LinkedIn Pulse, but also uh, certain social media platforms like Instagram or Snapchat You can't really claim that they're content-free. They, they all create content specifically for those channels that are aimed at a specific audience, so it is content marketing. Videos and podcasts are also content marketing, as are interactive content. Now, that's something that people don't necessarily think about, but quizzes and video games and mobile apps all provide value or entertainment with content um, to that audience. Uh, infographics are another one. Guides and webinars, such as this one. It's very meta that I'm currently giving you a, a content marketing uh, webinar, <laughs> you know. Um, but also things like white papers and in-person events like conferences and meetups, research pieces, and I'm sure we're going to keep on adding more and more, especially with artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things coming along. So it's very much an etc. What doesn't count as content marketing is maybe um, quite important really to keep in mind. So I would count things like adverts, cold calls, uh, spam of any kind. Essentially, any time where you've been sold something that has no value to you because it's not relevant to you and it just feels like um, somebody just shouting at you in all caps with exclamation marks. Um, I love this quote by Tim Hughes at Oracle, so I've shared it at the bottom of that slide, which says, 40% of people choose root canal surgery over hearing a sales pitch. Now, I've not had root canal surgery, but I do hear it's pretty painful. It just goes to show how much um, sales pitches are turning people off. So if you're wanting to attract new customers, you should really you know, put aside or at least vastly reduce these um, tactics, really, and concentrate more on content marketing. I wanted to share here uh, the Hero Hub Hygiene Content Pyramid, which is um, a term that was coined by YouTube originally, and I think it's a, a very useful um, image, really, uh, for thinking about the type of content that you're already creating and what you could maybe create in the future. So first there's Hero, which most businesses do in some form or another. That's, you know, the big ticket event, the, the glossy advert, the research piece, the white paper, the seminar. It's something that you tend to spend quite a lot of money on and focus a lot of your marketing activity around, and it can often be outsourced, so businesses don't tend to struggle with the hero stuff too much. Then there is the hygiene, so that's the, the basics, like the, the who we are, what we do, that's your, your websites, you know, about us section, it's your catalog, it's your brochure, it's something that's always switched on for audience, so when somebody is researching you, that's you know the, the, the basic layer that they're going to find before they dig further. 
And then, last but not least, there is Hub, and that's something that is continual. It's the ongoing insights, um, the commentary, the newsletters, also the social media updates. It's timely, relevant, and it's expert-led, and it is the bit that businesses struggle with the most. And that's the kind of content that we're going to be concentrating on today. So, what are the advantages of content marketing? I want you to brace yourself for some stats. I've put a whole lot here. This is going to be recorded and shared later, so um, don't worry if I'm whizzing through it a bit too fast. You can always come back to it uh, later on. The main takeaway, really, from these stats is that content marketing costs less than you know your adverts and your other ways of reaching out that are more traditional, and it generates more leads. And then the other important takeaway is that uh, the buyer journey has changed. Now, you know, maybe there was a time when people didn't research as thoroughly uh, companies, but with the internet, you know, it's very easy for people to research you thoroughly, not just what you are putting out, but what other people are putting out about you. And that's something to really bear in mind. So there's a quote, um, a stat here that says 85% of B2B buyers use social media as a part of the purchasing process. 85%. So you can't really afford to not, you know, have an active uh, social media presence and, uh, you know, a well thought out content marketing strategy, really. However, I do have a caveat, um, of course. One is that not all content is good content. So when I say that, I'm thinking of blog posts, for instance, as one example, that aren't really content marketing because they're just selling you something. They're just telling, it's all me, 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 and not you, 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 really. It's not helping the audience. It's not giving any value. It's just promoting themselves and their business, which isn't great. Um, there's a lot of noise, you know, out there. There's a lot of content being produced. And if you're just saying the same thing as everybody else in the same way, then that's just um, unfocused and it's not going to be very effective really. So not all, con not all content is good content. The other thing is don't just hit publish and walk away. You know, the, the content that you're creating should be part of a wider business strategy and you should be sharing it, you know, and you should be promoting it in, in a way um, that makes sense really for your, for your business. It's a bit like a Tamagotchi really. Um, content, you know, if you walk away, it's just going to die. Nobody's going to see it. So you've got to maximize its potential. And I'll be going into more depth about how to do that in just a second. Don't worry. So how do you do content marketing? Well, that's pretty important. First of all, you need to know your audience. That is completely essential because all good content marketing comes from understanding your audience. So who are they? You know, who are you should um, ask yourself these questions. What are their challenges and their pain points? Do they struggle with something in particular? What is their role in the purchasing process? Are you really you know trying to aim at an influencer or at a decision maker, the person who's holding you know the money? Um, where do they get their information? You know, where do they consume their content? Do they um, are they more of an online creature? Do they read certain uh, publications? Um, and you know, what specific words do they use to describe their problems, their customers, and their industry? It's very important to have the right keywords to use to be able to speak to them in their own language. And you might think that it's a little bit tricky to, to find out this kind of information, but if you've got existing clients, for instance, why not, you know, ask them some questions directly, find out, you know, from them what they prefer. And you might find that you've got all sorts of assumptions about them. I think often um, B2B companies underestimate how much um, their customers are online. They like to think that they're more traditional, but actually not really the case anymore. And you should look at your analytics as well, you know. If you don't have any, then that's something you need to do something about because it's incredibly useful at finding out all of these things. Um, and once you've got an idea of who your audience is, this really should inform not only the kind of content you're creating, but also where you are creating it. So yes, so step one, know your audience. And then step two, give the audience what they want.
and what they probably want is boring content. Okay, so hear me out. Uh, <laughs> I do have a very good example of this that's coming up in the next slide. I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, it's a man called Josh Heyman who um, runs a quiz building platform. And originally, when he was creating content, he was always trying to go after the next, you know, shiny thing. He was basically trying to be BuzzFeed, you know, and creating, you know, content that would get upvoted and, and, and liked. But the problem is, is it wasn't getting liked by the right people, and it wasn't actually translating into sales. So in the end, he decided to change his strategy a little bit. And uh, I'll just show you. There we go. So he decided to actually answer a question that one of his customers had asked, which is how to make a personality quiz. Um, I think it was on Facebook, actually. But yes, anyway, he decided to write it. And just after it went up, four people signed up and paid for his product. And not just that, but it's become a piece of evergreen content. And for those of you who don't know, evergreen content is content that doesn't go out of date. It keeps on being useful to people. And often that requires updating it a little bit, you know, to keep it relevant because obviously things change. So for instance, if he had written um, a blog about, you know, Facebook personality quizzes, then every time that Facebook makes a change that could affect it, he probably needs to update it, for instance. And he called this personality quiz boring content because it's not the kind of stuff that will be shared on social media because the general internet reader couldn't care less. But the thing is, to the very you know specific person that he was aiming it at, it was extreme, extremely valuable. So it was a win in that sense. I don't know if anybody's been keeping uh, an eye out today on the B2B uh, marketing summit. Uh, I have, and I've been looking at the slides that Joe Polizzi has been sharing. And there was this slide here, which I couldn't resist um, adding to this webinar which I think illustrates perfectly what Josh Heyman has just done, which is find that sweet spot between your knowledge and your skills and your customer's pain point or passion. In this case, it was probably a little bit of a mix of both. Um, and so managing to find that sweet spot, sweet spot is where content marketing magic happens. And really, the takeaway from Josh Heyman's sort of example is that, a po that it was a post that was written by an expert about his subject expertise in which he answered a question that was asked by his target audience. I mean, that's a win. It was a lead conversion. That is really the dream. The more expert you are in a field, the easier it is to forget that what you take for granted, other people don't. But you could all do the same thing that Josh Heyman has done just by listening to your audience and your prospective audience. Um, you've got to remember that no one, no one is going to complain, that you've made something too simple to understand. So I've got a few things here that hopefully will set off a few sparks in your brain of ideas that you might um, put into action. So here are a few questions I'd like you to ask yourself. You know, what thorny aspect of your business could you clarify? You know, what assumptions do people make? For instance, you know, when you're in a pub or at a networking meeting and you tell people what your job title is or who you work for, are there some questions that keep on, you know, coming up? Those are good questions to answer, you know. You know, which questions do your clients keep asking you, you know, help with or uh, clarification on? And then going back to analytics, what search terms turn up in your statistics time and time again? And are you answering those queries appropriately? Um, actually, one mind goal for that is if you do have a search bar on your website, you can find in Google Analytics what people have been typing in there and whether they've actually been managing to find results. And if they're not managing to find results from those, those um, those would be great areas to, to create content for. So that's a quick tip. The third point, really, is to create focused content. So again, don't, don't do what Josh Heyman used to do, which is be really scattered and, and write on every shiny new so subject. Really find your niche and zone in on it. Um, it's also really great for SEO. 
Um, so recently, Google's SEO quality rating guide came out, and it stated that a high quality page requires, uh, you know, a satisfying amount of high quality main content, but also that the um, the page and the website are expert, authoritative, and trustworthy, and that it has a good reputation for that particular topic. So really the takeaway here is that you should be regularly updating your website with focused content written by experts. Okay, so it's all very well me yammering on about this, but it's, uh, it's a lot easier to see with concrete examples. So I thought I'd share a case study of the FinTech Collective. So they are a venture capital firm in NYC, so it's pretty uh, specific. Um, and I wanted to share their content strategy, and I think it's a really interesting one because often when you think of content marketing strategies, you think of really elaborate videos or incredibly long blog posts, and they go for a much more bite-sized approach, and it works. So I thought I'd talk about them. So they launched um, their news.fintech.io um, hassle in March 2014. And actually, this stat has gone far higher since I took that screenshot. But they've published, um, at the time, uh, nearly 2,000 daily news articles and 83 weekly newsletters to their private list of investors, entrepreneurs, and industry players. And um, really, they're, they're, they're marketing it out as a very specific person. And they're saying, you know, this is for you to keep abreast of the latest news in fintech in 30 seconds or less so that they can skim the headlines and have something to say when they head into the next meeting. So they're really positioning themselves as you know, the expert who is translating um, the breaking news on that particular niche for you so that you have something to say in your meeting. And here is an example. As you can see, it is super short. It's only two sentences, but it works. Um, and you might think, oh, I don't see how that's really going to help with anything. But they have been getting results. So this was only a few months after they'd launched um, their, their product, um, their blog, sorry. And they became um, one of the 21 people in the New York fintech scene you need to know about, which is fantastic. And then later on, they were invited to reception in the pres presence of Her Royal Highness the Duke of Cambridge to celebrate the great success of British technology companies in New York and the growth of the UK as an international tech hub. So again, pretty fancy. So this is in November, and let's remember that they only launched this in March. But they were seen as experts in the field because they were positioning themselves that way, you know, as the sort of translator between the news and these busy venture capitalists, um, their clients in general. And uh, yeah, so they ended up being invited to um, Downing Street. So again, did quite well. And here's the clincher, really. They're doing incredibly well on SEO. So just as I was saying earlier with the Google quality page ranking, here you can see that they're you know, top for FinTech News NY and VC FinTech New York. They're right, right there at the top, which isn't bad for a small company. And I think the takeaway to, 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 to take from this is that they worked within their limitations. You know, they're, they're, they're a startup. They're not massive. And they decided to, to focus on this particular area, and they did it extremely well. One of the tactics that they do, actually, as well for this, for, for this kind of collaborative blogging, is that they save relevant articles using Pocket uh, during the week. And then they have a meeting once a week where they look upon all those pieces of news and decide what they're going to be saying about them. Then you know, a few relevant people from their team go off and do just that that day. And then the next day, they send out a newsletter to all of their key contacts. And they have amazing open rates on that um, newsletter. And so that, that's a tactic, a strategy that has worked really well for them. It won't work for everybody. This is just one example. You probably, almost certainly, do not have their specific audience. But it worked for them. So next, I thought I would discuss a few tips. 
Um, so firstly, inspiration. That's the thing that people find really hard in general. Uh, is, you know, they're always asking me, how do I find inspiration to create content? So firstly, there's uh, social listening. How are people talking about you or about um, something that's tangential to what you are uh, offering? So for instance, with PASL, you know, I could be searching for content marketing and see, you know, how can we change that conversation? How can we be a part of it? You can use tools, you know, like social mention or set up alerts with TalkWalker or um, Google Alerts to sort of keep abreast, you know, every time an article comes out that mentions you or that mentions the topic that you are a part of. So that can be a great thing. You can sort of create content in response to that. The other thing is also to be listening to what your competitors are doing if you have competitors. So uh, a tool like BuzzSumo, for instance, is fantastic for that. Uh, the other thing is to keep abreast, you know, of what is being shared in relevant groups on social media. Um, also FAQs, FAQs are great, so frequently asked questions. So again, you could build up your, your FAQs as a series of articles, videos, and podcasts. You could read industry news and comment on it as well. But the one that I think is fantastic is to create and maintain an editorial calendar. So. This is LinkedIn's editorial calendar, so it's available for everyone that creates content on LinkedIn Pulse. And as you can see, it's pretty uh, wide open because obviously the people who use LinkedIn Pulse are from all sorts of industries with different levels of seniority. So it's got to be something that can work for a wide range of people. So for instance, this month it's big ideas, what to change now. As you can see, that could apply to all sorts of people. But I would really recommend doing a specific one for your own business, uh, for whoever is creating the content in your, in your business. So this is one that I've done for Passel, for instance, which is completely modeled on the LinkedIn one. So I chose topics that were relevant to us and to our audience. So for instance, this month we're creating content uh, on inspiration in unlikely places. So I, I think it's just so useful to have an editorial calendar, really, because you can have something to bounce against. The, the trick, really, is to not be draconian about it. It's not to tell your team that this is the only kind of content that they can create. But if you are feeling stuck for ideas, it's, it's great to have that base to, to bounce against. So, for instance, if I'm struggling to find enough content to write about in one week, I go to this calendar and I sort of wonder how I can twist, um, make, make that particular topic of the month my own. So that's where I find it incredibly useful. Now, the other thing is creation. Now, you're always hearing how quality is better than quantity, um, and I'm actually very much of the school of thought that quantity can generally lead to quality. And one of the reasons I would say that is because, you know, practice makes perfect for one. And for another, you know, if you only create one post a year, you've got really not much to work with. Whereas if you're creating a lot of content, you, you even just, you know, five to start with, then you've already got that to look back upon and you've got the data from that to make informed decisions going forward on what kind of content will work best. So you've got to give it a go, you know, um, and learn from your mistakes. That's the thing, people are often worried about making mistakes, but um, it's okay, you can make mistakes, just as long as you learn from them and improve. The other thing I'd say is to involve your whole team, not just the marketing team. And in fact, I would really encourage you to look far beyond the marketing team for content creation, because people want to hear from experts. And unless your business is, you know, marketing agency or so forth, you know, the experts aren't really going to be the marketing team. Um, but obviously not everybody is comfortable creating content, but you could find ways um, to facilitate that, maybe by interviewing them. That, that would be um, a completely um, acceptable way of showcasing your experts. But they're a great strength, you know, to your business and you really should showcase them. And then the last point I'd like to make here is to 
not be afraid to recycle your content or repeat yourself. And this is all about extending the reach and the lifespan of your content. So for instance, you know, blog posts can become a podcast, a webinar, an infographic, and you can share snippets of it to platforms like Medium or LinkedIn. So you just put a little extract and then you can add read more, which will link back to your site. Um, you know, if you're using video, for instance, you can upload it both to video networks like YouTube or Vimeo, but also as a native video on other platforms like Facebook. Same goes with podcasts. There are so many platforms out there for podcasts. You know, why limit yourself to just one when your audience is almost certainly not going to be on just one of them? And if you miss the one that they're on, then that's a bit of a shame. So here's just a quick example, for instance, of um, a blog that I uh, upcycled, as it were, or recycled into other formats. As you can see, it's incredibly short, just three paragraphs. Uh, the snippet at the bottom is from an article that shared our research in, I think it was Solicitor's Journal. And so I just wrote a very quick summary of it. And I transformed that into an infographic and also into a slide share, and then shared the slide share onto uh, Medium. Um, yeah, so as you can see, I mean, that's a really short piece of content, but I managed to make it um, extend itself. And you can do that too, and it doesn't necessarily need to take very long. I would really recommend, especially for visuals, to use a tool like Canva. Um, I might do another webinar specifically on the wonders of Canva because it, it just saves a lot of time when you're trying to translate uh, pieces of content, uh, visual content, into different formats. Um, another thing for creation, this is um, a checklist that I've put together. These are seven questions that I think everybody should ask themselves before publishing a piece of content. So firstly, does your post have actual content? Going back to what I was saying before, you know, is it just basically a sales pitch? Uh, is it just saying the same thing that everybody else is without your own spin on it? Uh, two, you know, is your post the best version of itself that it can be? Um, so I can understand sometimes you just get very excited with a piece of content, you just want to send it out, but maybe you could push it further, and that's worth thinking about. Uh, next, is the title going to make people want to find out more? The number of times I've seen people use quite rea reactive titles like awesome or this is a bit of a problem, um, which makes sense once you click through, but the thing is for people to want to click through, they've got to know that it's going to be interesting to them. So my advice really is to be more precise with your titles. Um, you know, Give them something so that they know it's actually relevant to them. It's worth doing that. Um, and hand in hand with that, is that image going to pull people in? Have you just gone for a really bog standard, boring, blurry photo? Or have you gone for something that, along with the title, is going to intrigue people into clicking and finding out um, what you're on about? So, I mean, this sounds all a bit focused on blog posts, but it goes as well for other content. So, for instance, with YouTube videos, you can upload your own thumbnail image to it, um, which, again, can make the difference between somebody clicking and not clicking, because you often look at the thumbnail and sort of think, oh, so that's the kind of content that's going to be in this? So, worth doing that. Next, um, this sounds very basic, but have you proofread it? The number of times I've seen typos, and they're generally quite off-putting, you know? It makes you think that the person hasn't spent enough time um, on that particular piece of content. Um, so it doesn't feel very respectful, I would say, so proofread it. And generally, you know, most uh, browsers have sort of inbuilt sort of spell checkers that sort of highlight in green or in red when you have made a mistake, so there aren't many excuses for that. Are any of the links broken is another one worth, you know, clicking on preview and checking all of them. And again, you know, just hit preview in general to check that everything is as, be, as, as it should be. Because um, you never know, there could be some formatting issues that make uh, what looked in the uh, editing page like a beautifully sort of put together page look completely bizarre once it's actually gone through. And often people do hit publish and then 
walk away from it and not actually check whether everything is, is working. So it's definitely worth doing. I'm kind of the opposite of that. I sort of keep checking and rechecking throughout the day and often I spot things that I wouldn't have normally. So that's for creation. Next is distribution. So again, as with creation, I would say get your whole team involved, even if they're not working in marketing, because employee advocacy, which is quite the buzzword of the moment, is just a really great way to organically increase your reach. Um, people trust people, as you know, and they're probably going to trust people that aren't your marketing manager or your official channel as much as they are going to trust um, your other employees. So really the, the, the best thing here is to try and make it as easy as possible for people to do that. So maybe you know use an internal newsletter with like links to share on social media um, the posts uh, or other pieces of content that they've created and also have a good you know flexible social media policy for for your team um, so you can sort of make make it as easy as possible for them to get access to this content maybe through a shared folder and also give them leeway to share it in their own voice you don't want people to just sound like corporate robots so give them a little bit of freedom there but also some guidelines because obviously some uh, social media usage isn't um, appropriate so it has to sort of go both ways there and then the other thing I say for distribution is to vary the ways in which you share your content on social media try out you know different hashtags and visuals to see what is working best if you have a social media manager like I do um, I use buffer it's really great because you can see in the analytics which posts have been working best and then you can um, re-put them into your queue so you can share them again and again and um, you can experiment that way very easily. Um, so don't be afraid to repeat yourself on faster paced networks like Twitter. And then the other thing I'd say is um, if you're only using the big three or some of the big three, which I would say are LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook, maybe think about branching out to one other network that is not typically, you know, um, sort of thought of in relation to your business because that might be a really great way to draw attention to yourself. So maybe it's Instagram or Pinterest or Snapchat or one of the many new networks out there where your audience might be hanging out. I don't discard them automatically as not being there for you. Um, just give it, give it, give it some thought. So, this is your action plan. Just to finish off quickly, one focus on your business's core subject expertise. You have an expertise. Just, just find out what it is and concentrate on it. Put together an editorial calendar. Decide who will be creating the content and how often. I mean, it has to be manageable. That is the thing. But it also, and it has to be sustainable. Decide which platforms it will get created and shared on. I would say start small and expand once you've mastered those networks. So having just recommended that you try out some new ones, don't try all of them at once. You know, be selective. You only have so many resources. Most importantly, decide what success looks like to you. And after a month's review, after a month review what you've done, you know, which platforms are performing best, which posts are popular. Do you need to modify your strategy? Is the schedule too intense? These are all valid questions um, that you should be asking yourself, but give it a little bit of time to do its thing because content marketing isn't a story of overnight success. It takes time, and that is really the main thing to remember. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming, and I hope this was useful. Do email me. Do tweet Passel if you have any other questions. Have a lovely afternoon.